I love the message of that song, and I don't think there's anything that probably could give us God's eyes for the people around us more than missions can. So we're going to talk about that a little bit more this morning. We're at our doing our missions conference. If you're joining us, uh, you weren't here last Sunday. We started our missions uh, conference last week, and today we're talking more about missions, about how we can be partners with the body of Christ to make a difference around the world. If you're joining us online, we welcome you as well, and excited to be able to share about this uh, today. And so uh, if you use it, if you have your Bible and you want to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 8, you can do that. It's page number uh, 697 in our house Bibles if you're here in the auditorium and you're using one of those. And we'll get there in a minute. But uh, in uh, 2014, somebody pulled into a Starbucks drive through probably not an unusual activity, right, in St. Petersburg, Florida. And when they got ready to pay for their coffee, they decided to pay for the person behind them, too. You've heard about this kind of stuff, right? Anybody ever been in one of these lines before? Wow, you guys hang out in some generous parts of town. And, uh, and so they paid for the person behind them. And when that person came to the window, they went to pay. They said, no, the person in front of you paid. And they said, well, I'll get the guy. I'll get the next car. And that went on for 378 cars. I don't know who was in car number 379. No, <laughs> it was probably somebody who looked in the rearview mirror and saw a van full of people and thought, this stops now, somebody's got to do it, and I will be that person. But uh, that's pretty amazing. I've heard of that happening, and maybe you've been a part of that. Have you ever been a part of one of those pay work, kind of pay it forward experiences in your life? It could be in a, in a drive through line like that. Uh, before they, everyone got an eye pass in, in Illinois, I know I had times before where I would come up to go through the toll booth, and in the tollway, they, uh, someone had, in front of me had paid for my toll as well. Uh, that, as, that, as the years have gone by, that's become a more and more expensive proposition, uh, Illinois Tollway. But um, maybe you've been there, whether someone did that for you, someone helped you out or did something for you in some way, or maybe you've had the opportunity to be on the other side of it where you got to pay it forward, where you got to help someone else. And that's what we're talking about here uh, this week, about this idea in, in our mission conference this year, this idea of going beyond our walls. In other words, uh, taking something that's uh, outside of who we are, it's not focused on us, it's not about meeting our needs, getting our deal, doing what we want, but it's about how can we make a difference in the lives of somebody else, oftentimes in the lives of people that we'll never meet, that could never pay us back, that could never do any of those things, and so that's what we're doing, and so we do this every year, and we kind of go on, we're on a kind of an October to October cycle with our missions giving, and when you came in, uh, today, if you're here in the auditorium with us on your chair, uh, you'll find you found a faith promise card. And I'll talk more about that in a little while. But that's what we do. We make a faith missions promise from October to October and we go for it because missions to me is the ultimate pay it forward. Because if your life has been changed, if you're a Christian today and your life has been changed by coming to know Christ, you would you would want to pay that forward to help other people share that experience, and to have that same life-changing moment with God. And when you read the book of Acts, which is kind of a history of the, of the launch and the starting of the Christian church, and really then after Acts, most of the rest of the New Testament is also kind of gives us a look into how the church formed and was started. There were times where I'm sure that the people who were following Jesus wanted to kind of I don't know if they wanted to quit, but they definitely probably wanted to keep it to themselves because they were being persecuted, they were being chased out of where they lived, they were being imprisoned, they were being beaten, some were being put to death, and they probably had every reason in the world to want to kind of just like, er, stop paying it forward, stop sharing this message forward. But they, when you read in the scriptures, what you find out is they would remember, and Paul and other church leaders, the Apostle Paul and would remind them about what Christ had done for them, and it kind of, it compelled them. From the very start, there was pushback against the Christian church, and they would continue to go forward because of what Christ had done for them. Jesus said this in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 10, verse 8. He said, freely you have received, freely give. Freely you have received, now freely give. And that word freely there doesn't mean just without cost, like, you know, just it's free. But it means to give wide open, to not hold anything back. It's kind of, I guess, maybe like in the military or other, other circumstances where someone stands in front of their superior and they say, and they're asked a question, they say, permission to speak freely, which means what? Can I tell you what, how, what thing, how things are really going? Can I tell you the truth here? Can I, or do I have to hold back? Do I have to kind of, and if, they, if they're given permission to speak freely, then it's like, here you go. And Jesus said, in the same way, freely you've received, now freely 
give. Don't hold anything back. Don't let anything hold you back from doing that. You know, one of our big core values here at Journey is generosity. We want to be a, a church that is generous. And I think if there's any place as a church and as Christians that we would want to be generous, it's in the area of missions. And here's why. Because it's not for us. If I stood up here and said, hey guys, we're going to have a building program. We need to raise X amount of dollars because we want to build a new building. That's awesome. And you guys are generous and you would give. You did that so we could get into this place. But here's what I know. We would benefit from that, wouldn't we? Or if I said, hey, we need new, you know, we need recliners in here instead of regular chairs. Oh, should I start that GoFundMe right now? Uh, you know, or whatever. People would be like, yeah, that's great. Or, or other things that we could do or, or will we invest. And, 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 and that's, there's not anything necessarily intr intr intrinsically wrong with that. But what I love about missions and why I'm usually more aggressive to, to ask, to challenge you to give when it comes to missions and other things is because none of it stays here. Every penny, not even every dollar, every penny that you ever give to this church that's designated for missions, 100% of that goes to missions. Nothing, we don't, we have no administrative, we have no overhead, we have no, we don't take a percentage off. 100% of what comes into this church for missions goes out to missionary partners that we have. We believe in the, in the power of missions. And that's why I think it's the ultimate way that we can pay it forward. Because we, we you know, again, uh, you saw, you've seen video, you've seen pictures, you've heard stories about people in, here in our community or in other parts of the world. You'll never meet them. You'll never get a chance to talk to them. You'll never get a chance to hug them. You'll never get a chance for anything. But you know what? You are changing their lives through your giving and through your generosity, through your prayers, through your going. Um, and so I want us to look, so we can grab onto this, I want us to look at, at a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to a group of Christians in the city of Corinth, it's, which is in Greece, and encouraging them to be generous. So here's what it is. So Paul's written this letter. In our book, in our Bible, it's the book of 2 Corinthians. But it was a letter that Paul wrote to a group of Christians that lived in a city called Corinth. And he's, in his letter, and this is like, you know, like you're writing a letter, so you're just writing things that you want to, you know, communicate. And he says, I want you to be generous. And he wanted them to give resources, finances, to help the church in Jerusalem. Because they were there, they were having to battle out. The persecution was heaviest there, and, and, and they were trying to really reach out, and there were some challenges there. And he said, I want you to give. And so to encourage them, as he, after, right after he challenged them to give, he wanted to encourage them, and so he, he kind of challenged them. And so he started talking about the generosity of another church. Kind of spur them on a little bit, you know what I'm saying? And, and uh, he reminds them of something, and here's what he wrote to them. It's in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through 3. And he says this, Now I want you to know, dear brothers and sisters, that God in his kindness has done through the church, what, the, what God has done, through the churches in Macedonia. They're being tested by many troubles, and they're very poor. But they are also filled with abundant joy, which has overflowed in rich generosity. Think about that. He said they're very poor, but they have abundant joy, and the, and the, the overflow of their joy is rich generosity. He said, for I can testify that they gave not only what they could afford, but far more, and they did it of their own free will. So to encourage the Christians to be generous in Corinth, Paul points out the generosity of these Macedonian Christians and uh, the church and, and the churches there. He's using them as an example of generosity. This morning, I was I was thumbing through Twitter uh, this morning, which I probably shouldn't do, but I was just doing it, you know, just what the world got to say. And I loved what somebody uh, shared a, a post by a guy that I I just have been learning more about. His name is Rodney Smith Jr. And a few years ago, Rodney Smith Jr. started a, a, an organization called Raising Men and Women Lawn Care Service. And he challenged young people, especially young people that, are, that may be in disadvantaged neighborhoods or in disadvantaged situations, to serve their community by going out and mowing the lawns of the disabled, of the elderly, of people who can't do it for themselves, and doing it for free. And he's had young people all over America do this. And his, he has what he calls the 50-yard challenge. And when a young person, and I don't know where they get to, they borrow a mower, they do whatever they can, they go out, and if they, once they have mowed 50 lawns for free of people who cater for themselves, Rodney Smith Jr., or someone that works with them, but usually it's him himself, comes to wherever they live. He goes all over the country, does this, and gives them their own brand new lawnmower, trimmer, and leaf blower. 
and says, here, listen, now you can continue to serve your community, but you can also go out and start mowing, maybe charging to mow some of the lawns and do whatever. But he is doing something because he wants to teach these young people, young men and young women all over. He's raising men and women leaders by doing lawn care. And whenever I read a story like that, I get inspired. Does that kind of click with you guys? And you think, man, what could I be doing to make a difference? How could I be helping someone like this guy, Roddy Smith Jr., who started with a small, you know, just a simple idea. If, what would it do if, to teach these kids leadership and responsibility if they went out and just sort of mowing people's lawns and doing it to serve their community and make a difference? And now he's got this whole thing going. And, you know, I'm reading that and you're thinking, well, man, maybe I should, like, send him money for, to buy a lawnmower. You know, I, you start thinking about it. It inspires you. And that's what Paul is doing with the Corinthians. And he's using these churches in Macedonia and, and especially in the city of Philippi, where we get our letter in the Bible, which is the book of Philippians. And basically Paul's saying, if you want to know, Corinthians, I want you to be generous to the, to the church in Jerusalem. And if you want to know what that looks like, I, look at the Philippian church. Look at the church of Macedonia and what they did. They, even though they're very poor, man, they have this great abundant joy, and that joy overflows in generosity. And that's what we want for our church. That's what I want for, for your life, is for us to be known as a church for our generosity, for us as Christians to be known uh, for our generosity. You know, the media and the entertainment world are not giving Christians in the church really rave reviews these days. Have you noticed? Right now what we are is we're the evangelical voting block. That's who we are right now as the church. But name the last time you saw that, you remember that, that, that TV sitcom or that series that had that really cool evangelical Christian as a main character, right? We're always the weirdos. The, bump, the, the, the wet blankets, the whatever. But what I believe is that God wants the church to be known. And I don't think we have to try and impress anybody with how cool we are, even though you guys are extremely cool, extremely cool. But we can impact our culture and our world by our willingness to give and to serve and be known for our generosity. That's the way the church has been known from the very beginning. In fact, some of the, the Roman M Empire and, and the Jewish leaders that wanted to shut the church down, the Christians down in the early history of the church, one of the reasons they said they, said they couldn't do it is they said everybody knows how good these people are and how much they're helping. In fact, they help our people more than we help our people. We can't shut these guys down no matter what we do. And that became the trademark, and that's the trademark that I think we want to have. The Philippian church wasn't doing this because they were just loaded with cash and so they thought they'd help out. In fact, Paul says they're very poor but they're also filled with abundant joy, and that's resulting in rich generosity. What were they so joyful about? You know what they were so joyful about? They were joyful about their faith. They were joyful that God had changed and transformed their lives when they put their faith in open, that they had a hope that money could not buy and that poverty couldn't take away. And that joy caused them to be generous with what they did have. Some of you have experienced this because you've been on mission trips. You've been to South Africa or you've been to some of these nations. You've been on uh, in, the, in these trips and you've seen people who in our, in our uh, material value system, we'd say they have nothing or next to nothing. But then when you look at the joy they have in their life, they're going, wait a minute. Why are these guys so much more joyful than my neighbors who live in really nice houses and drive really nice cars and take really nice vacations? What's the deal? What's changed? What's transformed? What's caused that to happen? You know, when we were in South Africa or earlier at the beginning of this year, and God bless, but I've told people we were there at the end of January. It feels like five years ago with everything that's, like the last six months have been a long decade, right? But when we were there, you know, and you can see there's, uh, you know, Nell's up there putting uh, the roof on, on the school, and you can see uh, us working on uh, the house that we worked on. You can see some of the kids in the neighborhood, and you experience the joy that they have, and you go, you know what? Whatever we have, whatever we can give, it's worth it because it's making a difference. And Paul said this. He said they, he's talking about the, the people in Macedonia, especially the church in, in Philippi, the Philippians. He said they gave beyond what was comfortable. They gave sacrificially. They gave what they had. And this would have had a huge impact on the Corinthian church. And here, let me tell you why. Because for a number of reasons, see, the reason that there was a church in Corinth in the first place is because Paul went there as a missionary and started that church. There were no Christians in Corinth until Paul shows up. And he starts and he leads this movement. And now there is this church and he's writing them letters. And, and he's saying, you need, to be, you need to be generous like the Philippian church was. And you know why that would have meant so much? Is because the reason that Paul ended up in Corinth is because the Philippian church sent him there. They gave generously and that allowed Paul to continue to travel and he ended up in Corinth. 
The Philippians had paid it forward. Someone had sent Paul to the Philippians, and now they were sending him forward, and he ends up in Corinth. Look what it says in the, in the letter to the Philippians. I'm going to read a few verses to you here. It says this, How I praise the Lord that you are concerned about me again. So he's writing to Philippians. He's not asking him for anything. He's giving him thanks. He said, I know you have always been concerned for me, but you didn't have the chance to help me. Not that I was ever in need, for I've learned how to be content with whatever I have. I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I've learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it's with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or little. For I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. Even so, you have done well to share with me in my present difficulty. As you know, you Philippians, listen, were the first, were the only ones who gave me financial help when I first brought you the good news and then traveled on from Macedonia. No other church did this. In other words, the Philippians are the ones who enabled Paul to continue on, and that's how he ended up in Corinth. And that's, so as he's writing this letter to the Corinthians, he's like, kind of saying without saying is, you know, the only reason you guys are even getting this letter is because the Philippians gave, even out of their poverty. He said, even when I was, with, was in Thessalonica, you helped, you sent me more than once. He's, again, he's thanking the Philippians for their giving. I don't say this because I want a gift from you. Rather, I, I want you to receive a reward for your kindness. He said, at the moment, I have all I need and more. I'm generously supplied with the gifts you sent me with Epaphroditus. They are a sweet-smelling sacrifice that is acceptable and pleasing to God. And this is the same God who takes care of me, will, and, and this same God who takes care of me will supply all your needs from his glorious riches, which have been given us in Christ Jesus. So when Paul goes out on his second missionary journey to places where the gospel has never been shared, he goes to Macedonia, and one of the first places he ends up is in Philippi. And as that, the, uh, many people become believers in Philippi and kind of form the church of, of Philippi, the Philippian church, well, he, they, they say, Paul, you need to keep going. You need to keep telling people about Jesus. You need to, this has changed our lives. You need to, and, and, and even though they didn't have much, somehow out of their poverty rises up rich generosity. And they're rich towards, and they give them, they say, Paul, keep going. And one of the places that Paul lands is in the city of Corinth, supported by the Christian church. And they continue to give, Paul says, he says, you know, you gave to help the church in, in Jerusalem. When I was in prison, you sent Epaphroditus with more things to help me to get through. And here's the deal. The Philippians were willing to give generously. Why? Paul writes it in verse 19 that, that we just read. Why? Because they believed that God would continue to supply everything they needed through Christ. Paul reminded them that. He said, listen, you've given out of your poverty, but I want you to know this. God will supply all your needs in Christ Jesus. Everything you need. You know, one of the things, I think a lot of times when we hear stories about uh, what we saw from Blessed Ministries or some of the other things that we've shared with our missionary stories over the last couple weeks or even reading a tweet like that is when we think, I want to do something, I want to help. One of the biggest challenges is that fear that comes in that says, what if I give, that, give this gift and then I end up not having enough? Sometimes we worry that it's, it's not going to be enough for what we need, but oftentimes, at least for most of us probably that are in this room or watching online today, we worry that well, we, won't, we won't have enough for what we want. And that's a challenge that we have to be willing to step through. And the way that we step through that is we begin, like that song that they sang, I love that song, we have to have, we have to see differently. That song just keeps saying what? Give me your eyes. Oftentimes we talk about we need to have a vision for this. We need to have a vision for this, a vision for that. We need to have a vision for missions. What is vision? It's seeing. We need to look and see differently to help us get through that barrier, get over that barrier, get through that wall that says, but if I give this much every month, then I'm not going to have enough for that. I'm going to have to cut back my Starbucks to three days a week if I do that. And you don't want to be around me the other four days, right? We think things like that. But here's what I know. Here's what I know. When we are generous towards the things of God, God will always be generous towards us. He'll meet your need. I, I, I pray this a lot when we have, our, we have a little huddle with all of our volunteers on Sunday mornings before uh, church starts, and, and I always remember that, pro that verse in Proverbs that phrase that says this, the one who refreshes others will themselves be refreshed. See, the world wants to tell you, hang on to everything you can get, take care of yourself, you know, treat yourself, or whatever. That was, that was for all of you Parks and Rec people out there, or whatever, right? The world says what? Treat yourself. And what, is the what does Christ say? Give yourself away. And watch what happens. Some of us have 
done both things. We've gone through seasons of life where we have treated ourselves. Then we've gone through seasons of life where we've given the way that Christ and his and his uh, script and the scriptures tell us to. And we found so much more joy there than in the treat yourself seasons of life. It's amazing. It's amazing. Because the Philippians were generous, Christianity and the church were established in Corinth. But that's not where it started. See, the reason that, the, that Paul showed up in Philippi and in Macedonia was because another church that was in a place called Antioch had sent them out in the first place. In Acts chapter 12, it says this. One day, as these men were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Appoint Barnabas and Saul for the special work to which I have called them. So after more fasting and prayer, the men laid their hands on them and sent them on their way. The reason that Paul ended up in Philippi is because someone in Antioch had sent him out in the first place. Antioch was one of the first churches with a large Gentile or non-Jewish population. They sent out Paul and others who brought the gospel to a place in Macedonia called Philippi. And those new Christians in Philippi, despite their poverty, supported and sent Paul. So there's like this thing. You, you can start at Corinth and you go back up and go, how did, how did the gospel come here to Corinth? Well, a bunch of Christians in Philippi sent, sent somebody. Well, how, did, how in the world did there become a bunch of Christians in Philippi? Well, because there's this church in this place called Antioch, and they sent these two guys named Paul and Barnabas here. Well, how in the world did the, Christ, the Gentile church even start in a, in a place like Antioch? And they say, well, some people came from Jerusalem and told us about this man named Jesus and what he had done and how he had died and rose again. I'll say, well, how? And you can keep going back and back and back, and you can find your way. But here's the deal. As much as you can go backwards, you can go forward. Because it didn't stop there in Corinth, did it? The church kept paying it forward. They kept sending people out to take the gospel where it had never been before. And here's the deal. Somebody told somebody, and that somebody else told somebody, and somebody told somebody else, and then that somebody told you. And that somebody told me. Unless somehow God came and personally spoke to you and you got here by divine revelation, you got here because somebody told you. Might have been your parents, might have been your grandparents. Might have been a coworker, might have been a neighbor, might have been someone at school, might have been a missionary, it might have been a pastor, it might have been somebody you bumped into at a health club. It could be anybody, but somebody told somebody who told somebody who told somebody, and a couple thousand years later, someone told us. Someone told me. Someone told you. And that's why missions matters. And why giving to support missions matters. And I think it's our turn. I think it's our turn. Let me just review with you real quickly who are, and we'll wrap things up, our mission partners for this year. One of our mission partners and, uh, is Open Bible Global Missions, our MVP. Our church is a part of the Open Bible organization. Uh, pl presently, there are, uh, we have mission works going in 46 countries of the world. We, in fact, through that, we send missionaries, but we also are very focused on equipping local leaders. We want to have people who are native and indigenous to those countries and those populations. We want to train and develop them to reach their own people. Here's the cool thing. We've been a part of, of giving to Open Bible Missions for the last several years. Here's what I want you to know. In the years 2018 and 2019, in that two-year period, 872,432 people became followers of Christ through Open Bible Missions. Yeah, you should clap. Robert's like, should we clap? Yes, clap. Do it. 872,432 people. Because we, and we had a part of that. Someday, in heaven, assuming you make it, no, I'm just kidding, <laughs> you'll be there. You're gonna, you could bump into 872,432 people who might walk up to you and say, hey, thanks a lot for what you did. I'm here because of your generosity, because you paid it forward, because you gave, and I'm here. Last week, you saw some of those stories. Our uh, mission speaker, John Palmer, shared stories about lives. See, the thing is, that number is a great number, but every one of those numbers is a name. Every one of those names has a story. And every one of those stories matters to God. And you heard some of those stories last week. We're also partners with Blessman Ministries, and you heard our interview earlier with Dr. Blessman. You saw the video, and they do orphanages and church planting and other things in South Africa. A few years ago, as Dr. Blessman mentioned, we gave uh, money that built a, some gr a greenhouse over there that helps to, uh, in that feeding program, that helps to contribute to that 20,000 kids being fed weekly. 
Uh, Blessed Ministries provides shoes for kids that don't have them. Optical clinics. They do celebrate recovery ministry to help young people who are who are addicted to drugs and alcohol and other things. They they get to go into the schools. Uh, I got the opportunity. They actually every day at a lot of the public schools they have an assembly in the morning. They gather a thousand students or however many go there in a big thing, and they let, and they get up and the churches are able to stand up there and literally kind of do youth group with all the kids in the school and got an opportunity to do that and it opens doors to share the gospel. Another one of our partners, you saw the video with Jamel, is the Des Moines Dream Center, serving inner city neighborhoods here in uh, Des Moines. Do practical things like food and clothing, and you saw their programs, but also uh, their sidewalk, Sunday school, and adopt a block. And, 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 and he said this, you can give and we can partner. Last year, we, they're one of our mission partners, but also last year, when we did our Thanksgiving baskets that we do every year, we got the, we, they gave us about, I think, at least 25 or 30 households that we were able to go and take our Thanksgiving baskets to and pray with those families and bless them. We're, uh, our, our fourth partner for this year is Kosovo. And uh, uh, about a, almost a year ago, 11 months ago, we became the first church here in Iowa to be, take on a sister church partnership with uh, the church. And you, if you were with us either online or here last week and you saw Pastor Femi Sicoli shared about our relationship with them there. It's a young country. They've, they've only had an independent country for about 12 or 13 years. It's an amazing country. A couple million people, about 94, 95 percent are Muslim, but only four or five percent actually go to the mosque and practice it. It's, it's basically a secular society. But there's a, an opportunity for these churches to make a difference, and we heard about that. So we had the opportunity in some really amazing ways in Africa and Europe and, and Latin America and Asia with all of our partners to freely give what we have freely received. And that's what I'm asking you to do for this next year, to decide to pay it forward, to invest in eternity by supporting our mission partners both globally and locally. So let me just ask you this question. Here's the big question is this. What is God asking you to do to help the gospel journey beyond our walls? What's God asking you to do? Um, there's a faith promise card. Grab that. If it's on your chair or a chair near you, grab that. There's, there's two faith promise cards floating around here. One is a beautifully printed piece that we, that we ordered and got, but they put some kind of Teflon coating on it that you cannot write on. Uh, the other cards are the ones that are uh, homemade, but you can write on them. So hopefully you've got uh, the, the, the write on them uh, cards. I'd love for you to consider what is it that God might be asking you to do weekly, monthly, annually, from now until next October, to give towards missions. You know, this summer we did, we did the Proverbs of Jesus, and we talked about a, a proverb that really highlighted stewardship. We did our little stewardship project, and we gave... Uh, nine thousand, about nine thousand dollars to uh, starts right here, which was, and we had such a great time doing it. But we talked about the fact that it wasn't just the twenty or the ten or the fifty dollar bill that we asked you to grow that you need to be a steward of. But we wanted you to realize, remember that God wants us to be a, a good steward of everything He entrusts to us, every dollar, every talent, every idea. Be a good steward of that, and this is a great way that we can do that. And you know, the big principle of that proverb we looked at is this: it's not about equal amounts of money. It's about equal amounts of responsibility, equal amounts of sacrifice. To be willing to say, I, I can't maybe do what every, someone over there can do or what she can do or what he can do, but I can do what God has entrusted me to do and believe that that's what God's looking for is our faithful support. Ro Robert and, and Stu and, and those that are part of our missions team say it a lot. They say, our, our, we, we, we love to give as much as possible financially to support these things, but we'll, our first goal is this, we'd love 100% participation. We'd love everybody just to do something to move to move missions forward. This past Wednesday, I was so uh, excited to find out about this on Thursday, but on when, uh, Wednesday at our Journey students, our, our middle school and high school students, they met, and uh, Cody talked with them about missions, and he said, hey, what if we did a missions project that we would raise money for as a student ministry, we'll find a project, and we'll give money towards that. And the kids are like, yeah, let's do it. So they talked about it. And so he said, well, let's, I want everybody to kind of make a missions faith promise, kind of like what we're doing right here. And we kind of had some dollar amounts in our in mind, but Cody never said an, a number of what we wanted to do and, or what he thought we could do. And so he asked the kids just to think about it and pray about it. And they talked about it. Some of them said, well, I got a job and I can do this. And other kids, well, I do this, that, and things. And at the end of it all, they collected all the kids together, and their, their faith promises added up to $7,000. Now I'll tell them what we were thinking. We were, our goal was $2,500. we are losers, Cody. <laughs> but... 
But we just said, you know what, we, we're going to do this. And so I believe God can help these young people do this, don't you? And I believe that God can help you if you want to make a difference. You know, and Cody just said to him, hey, you know, what, this, if you gave up, you know, two Starbucks a month, you can give 10 He was just giving them examples. And they came up with these numbers on their own. And we're excited about that. But I believe that's a part of what God wants to do on a greater level here, even with us as a church. So I'll ask you again, what is God asking you to do to help the gospel journey beyond our walls? Because here's the deal, you guys. Someone told someone who told somebody who told you. So what will you do or what is God asking you to do to make sure that someone else, whether it's here in our city or around the world, gets to hear the same thing you got to hear? I want to pray for you. And as I pray, I want you just to prayerfully consider that. Um, when we get done praying, and Cody's going to come and wrap us up, but as you leave today, uh, right by the, the door over on this side, there's a table and there's a basket there, and there's a place where you can drop your completed faith promise card. I'm asking you to do that today before you leave. Um, and uh, if, if you weren't here last week, and maybe this is your first kind of blush at this, and you think, well, I need to, we need to talk as a family or whatever, I understand that. We, we'll, we'll keep reminding you for the rest of the month, for the next few weeks, to, to get those in. And for those of you who are watching online, we'll be sending you a faith promise in the mail so you can respond to that and do that as well. We want all of us to be able to join together to see what God can do through us collectively. But I want to ask you right now as I pray, would you just say, God, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do this year for missions? Let's pray together. Lord, thank you. Thank you, Lord, that you sent somebody to tell us about who you are, that we could find new life in Christ. That's the way the Bible describes it. And God, the reason that they came uh, and shared with us is because someone told them and someone told them. And the scriptures say in Romans that how can people believe in a God that they don't hear about? And how can they hear if no one tells them? And how can somebody tell them if they don't go? And how can somebody go if they're not sent? So Lord, we want to send somebody so they can go, others can hear, and they can believe, and their lives can be changed, not just for their time here on this earth, but their lives can be changed for eternity. So God, I pray that you would help us to rise up now in generosity, God. When we think about what we can give, it's not about, hey, what do we have left over, or what do I have sitting extra that I can do something with, but God... Maybe it's something that means we are going to have to make a sacrifice, that we might have to let something else go. We might have to stop some other monthly obligation or subscription. We might have to make a change to our budgeting in order to make it happen. But God, what are you asking us to do? Each and every person is here in each and every household, whether they're single, couples, families, whatever. What are you asking us to do? We just want to say yes to that. We want to be good stewards. We want to embrace the opportunity to be like the church in Philippi. Some of us might feel like we, we're Philippian Christians, that we are, we're in poverty and we don't have much to offer. But God, I pray that you'd help us to rise up with that same type of joy that would overflow in rich generosity. You can do that. Lord, bless each and every one of our missions partners as we give and use them in powerful ways. I pray all this in your name. Amen.